Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Ex Umbra's uh, podcast, to yes. our sixth episode. Does that sound right? That sounds good to me. We're not, neither of us are math teachers. So right. we've been thinking that, uh, we've so far we've just been these disembodied voices talking about uh, issues in an abstract way. So we have two solutions to that. One is to have video. So now we are embodied. Right. You know, Marshall McLuhan said, on the telephone you have no body. Oh, and on the right. podcast you yes. have no body too. Yeah. So now if you, if you feel like we're too disembodied, uh, we now have video for you to watch. We also... Uh, are going to talk a little bit about a bit of our experience. So for some context, Ex Umbra's podcast, we are classical Catholic education in podcast form. Uh, we are teachers at a online Chesterton Academy, Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore. Uh, look us up if you are interested in enrolling, yep. you or someone you love, in an online Chesterton Academy. Yep. Uh, and I am a Schoolman Fawcett, one of the teachers at Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore. And I'm speaking with my boss, Scholar McClarney, Doctor Doctor McClarney, the headmaster yes. of Chester Academy of Saint Isidore. So, uh, because it's an online school, uh, you, you may hear that and go, "Well, what does that entail? Like, what does your day look like? What is your job as a teacher?" Then, oh, wow. well, we have online classes, and uh, these podcasts hopefully give you a bit of a sense of what a, a dialogue in one of our classes might look like, a Socratic discussion would look like. Certainly. Uh, but I thought today might be a good day to talk a bit about uh, an experience that you and I had, actually. Absolutely. As yes. teachers. Uh, not only because it's interesting to us, uh, but if you're, especially if you're a teacher listening, and you are a social studies teacher, let's say, uh, thinking about how to teach social studies from a classical Catholic perspective, uh, I think we have a few insights today about what that might look like, what it might not look like. Uh, based on some discussions we had during this experience and after this experience. Uh, yeah. And I'm hoping, I mean, obviously we can uh, be of use for our uh, audience and listeners, but even for myself to get a better mm. understanding of the topic was realism. So first of all, yes. we can maybe talk about what is realism, uh, what right, were we yes. doing there, and uh, our reactions to it. Because I don't know about yourself, but for me, it usually takes me, there's a bit of lag between mm. when I hear something and I can process it and then think about it and talking about it as well. Well, I think it's a good sign. It's a good sign if you don't if you have a knee jerk reaction to things <laughs> and you digest them first. So let's, let's <laughs> thank get, you. I'll take that as a good no, sign. No, I, I, I okay. think so, yes. A lot, of, a lot of things are said in a foolhardy and impulsive way. And, and this is an example of something that did take some thought. But So here's some context um, Dr. Mark Clarney and I work in, uh, well, near Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, in this lovely uh, room that you see here. We don't spend yeah. all our time in this one room. We have our own cubicles. Yeah. Uh, but recently Lovely. we had a teacher's convention. That's right. Which is well, it's what it sounds like, right? Yeah. Uh, the teachers in the area all get to go out to a big convention center downtown with terrible parking. And uh, we get our choice of uh, sessions. You can go to a keynote talk uh, or you can go into individual rooms That's right. where teachers give you kind of professional development on how to teach different classes. Yeah. So. So I had to park at the uh, nearby theological college where I know some people, and I was hoping no one would uh, would penalize me. I left a little note in my car saying I'm picking out, I'm checking out some books today. So I am I am coming to Newman. <laughs> okay. that's, that's, that's really, really what I did. Yeah, that's how okay. I got away with it. Yes, so. and then took the bus to go downtown so I could get to, because the parking. If you've never been to Edmonton, please do come. We'd love to meet you. Don't try to park downtown. <laughs> it's yeah. it's rich. It's wretched there. Yeah. Um, but we, we were able to well, both... I, 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 what I did is I parked at a three-hour parking. So there's a three-hour parking, which obviously... There's that's no right. That's why you dashed off right I, afterwards. I had, that's why you yes. missed the end of the talk. <laughs> yes. Because uh, I had to get to my car before to move it. Sorry, it was two hour at that time. Or was it three? Anyway, I, I, I don't think it could have been two hours because the thing was from like 10 oh, right. to... It was, yeah. it was a whole morning session. Yeah. So the, you, you, as teachers, we can self-select what sessions we want to go to. So this one looked to me the most intriguing. It was on realism. It, it was I, the only interesting the, one. Perhaps. The morning, arguably, arguably, yeah. the, arguably the only interesting talk uh, of the day. Um, and there... Okay, well, first of all, what is realism and why did you well, find let's, it interesting? Let's, so, well, let's... Yeah, let's... So, okay, that's the context is yeah. that we both went to the same uh, seminar for this particular yeah. country conference and the title of it was well it was kind of misleading it was realism and the cold war i want to say yeah now i had known i'd heard of realism yep. i know a little about realism and realism we need to say is out of the gate this is not the same as like philosophical realism this is right. not the same as like realism versus nominalism which yep. we will probably talk about in the future right yeah, the existence yeah. of universals we may have a debate about it who knows yeah, yeah. i know we've had some clamoring for that yeah. this is different this means something else uh, but I wanted to hear it, this perspective, 
And so I go in, and I was... Well, should we define what realism no, is? No, let's, 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 let's let Mr. Hunt... We'll, we'll call okay. him Mr. Hunt. We'll, we won't call sure. him by his real name. We'll use okay. a pseudonym. We'll call him Mr. Hunt. Sure. Um, I, I showed up like 15 minutes late, so he may yeah. have said some the preliminary bu- the bus stuff. bus ride took a long time. Well, yeah, that's that's the downside to taking the bus, is you're, you, know, okay. you don't have as much control over where you're gonna, when you're going to get there. So I was late, so I missed the initial part, and I actually had to sit on the floor in the corner until, I think you noticed me, and, yeah. you know, like like the like the host in the parable, you invited the me to come up and sit at, yeah, sit at the table yes. with you. Um, and, and that was true. At the end of the second session, we uh, where there's a break, we actually did go to the front. So the last, yeah. you were the last in, but then you were first in the room. At, at, well, right, it's, actually, it's true. Was. That's okay. true. Yeah, so it was vindicated. So, so there we have that. So that was what the talk was about. Yeah, so the topic was called Realism, and the presenter was a, well, his name, so his name is Mr. Hunt, we'll call him, and he is a science teacher. By profession, he's not a social studies teacher, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know. Did he say anything at the preliminary beginning of it that I that would be helpful? Did, did he define realism at that point, for example? I also missed the first moment or two. No, but he okay. did. Oh, he definitely defined realism, so that was cool. Yeah, okay. I, I, I didn't. I, I don't know if he really gave his uh, his background or not, but it, it was really. Um, Mostly social studies teachers were there who were enthralled with what he was saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, well, should we define what realism Well, sure. Or? So he gave a bunch of examples of, oh, let's say, well, how would you explain it? A lot of examples from history of. Uh, yeah. And again, this is obviously in a Canadian context. So That's certain right, yes. events that Canada has been involved in, whether in the 1960s in the Congo through uh, peacekeeping, uh, whether it's in Haiti, uh, the other ones would be South Africa. Um, help me out now. Oh, yeah, I would say the former Yugoslavia, yep. so a couple more Kosovo. Yeah, the, ninth, the late 90s there, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit touched on Iraq. So the Iraq okay. war and, and, and the oh, yeah, that's right. tangential yeah. um, involvement of Canadians. There mm-hmm. was some involvement there. Mm-hmm. And then Afghanistan. Right, uh, yeah. and, and there was other examples that he was able to give or was willing mm-hmm. to get to. There's just only so much time you can yeah, get Of there. course, of course. Especially when you have a bunch of chatty social studies teachers who want yeah. to share their own opinions, which uh, yeah. was pretty brutal. So... He, these are all examples of interventionism, you, t- typically American interventionism, but maybe Canada supported or didn't oppose in other countries, inst- yeah. other, installing, you know, authoritarian regimes and this sort of thing. And Mr. Hunt suggested there's yeah. one paradigm through which yeah. you can explain all of them, right? Yeah. You can and explain it, how, how nations always act. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to be authoritarian. He's, he's using this the realism to explain how liberal democracies uh, behave. Or, or Vladimir Putin or, or China. Right, yes, exactly. So, so it's a um, paradigm or, or an approach that has explanatory power. Right, exactly. Which is, uh, I think, rather robust mm-hmm. in explaining, oh, this is what Canada was actually doing right, in Haiti. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is what happened in the Congo, and this mm-hmm. is why. As opposed to, often you'll hear narratives from through via the media of different nation states. Uh, well, one of the examples that came up was uh, when the recent conflict in uh, a war, in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where the media branch of uh, Russia, uh, I want to say it's RTE. Yeah, RTE, like that's that. right, yeah. yeah. RTE was um, taken down from, uh, I say YouTube, well, basically any any major platform in the West uh, that it was, it was removed from. And so this would be an example. Again, why? Well, uh, this is seen as um, the media branch of the state, uh, which is instigating the invasion. Now, of course, he's going to say, uh, well, that's every state has its own media, which is going to give a certain explanations to the populace as to why we're involved in this conflict that conflict right. or the other but he why thinks it's all it's all froth right all of our uh, all of the explanations that are given by these nations about why they're getting involved with each other or what they're doing he thinks no 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 really there's one underlying well, reason well, that well, actually explains three, all of it three reasons okay all right but but really they all one, under, they, they under fall, all fall under the umbre- umbrella of, of realism right yeah so he, yeah. he thinks realism it can explain why Every nation acts the way it does. Yeah. So the reason I mentioned him being a science teacher is because it seems to me like this is an attempt to reduce international politics to like a chemistry experiment. You know, these elements will always yes. follow this law. Yeah. They, you, yeah. you combine these things, it will always follow this pattern, right? That's what it seemed like he was doing to me. And he says, and realism is the scheme that explains it all. Now, how does he define realism as you... You took better notes than me. I can, I can try to give my, my account of it, but how did he... Well, okay, so... The states are always going to behave in, in certain ways. Now, there's three major mm, 
explanatory forces are that he uses that he fell back on as to why states do what they do. So one, it could be they're actually motivated by the interests of the elites. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily in the nation state. It's the, the, the interests of whoever's the elite in that society is, has the levers to motivate the state to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, okay, so for our, the example here, it might not, it might actually go against the overall interest of the nation. Uh, the example would be offshoring of much manufacturing in the late 90s, early 2000s in the United States of America. Uh, this is, gave much uh, uh, economic boost and with it um, military capacity to China. Uh, and so the argument was, why did we do this All right, from the American perspective? And the answer uh, came back as well. Um, it was in the interest of the elites. They were yep. able to uh, become massively rich uh, in, in ex, ex, um, uh, offshoring, uh, outsourcing yep. is the word, yeah, outsourcing, uh, outsourcing yeah. their um, the manufacturing. And this, this drove on costs, which then boosted the, the status of, of, of their, their wealth. Mm. That's one layer. That's one layer, yeah. And then the second, he has a couple of other layers to it as yeah. well. There was the... Uh, so so another layer is essentially this is in the um, the interest of the state. So the state itself, so those who are running the state, not the elites necessarily, but the overall well-being of the state uh, is that we need to intervene in... Congo or Haiti, wherever, uh, Afghanistan, because this is going to bring about a, uh, a greater benefit to us, to us. In, in, in the long run. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it could be in the interim, the short term, but either either way, this is an overall net benefit to our state, so we have to go and mobilize, mm-hmm. and this is the action we're going to take. So, we might come up with a different yeah. explanation right, to our yes. people yeah. as to why we're doing this, but this really is, it's going to serve our interests. Right, there we go. And that, that, that's... That's the hinge of it, I think. And the third yeah. layer was the... The third layer is, um, you. it's the law of the jungle. So mm-hmm. some states are forced to act uh, as best as they can towards the interest, but they might not necessarily um, have planned it out this way. So a good example would be states with lesser power. Mm-hmm. They're just following the law of the jungle. They have to. Uh, attack or, or defend or whatever the issue is, they have to behave this way because if they don't, it's going to lead to even dire straits mm. uh, for them. So that's that's the well, that'd be the situation for most nation states, right? Uh, they mm. they um, they're still going to try and act as best they can in their interest, but it's the law of the jungle out there. It's it's kind of like if you want to, I mean, students would uh, appreciate this who uh, are familiar with Hobbes and Rousseau, the state of nature, yes, right? Yes, Remember yes. that? Uh, so so the the state of nature is. We'll come, um, we'll come it, back to this theme. The yes. war of all against all oh, mm-hmm. on this forensic level. So yes. so my me and my household. Well, I might not cultivate my lands too much. I might not build up an aqueduct system or whatever it is because I know there's another wolf that's going to come around mm. and get me and I might be the strongest cartel member at the moment if you want to think of it that way but eventually I'm going to get long in the tooth and there's going to be another wolf who will come even though I can dominate for now mm. and then I will lose what I have so why would I bother yeah. building this up so th- mm. that's the state of nature that that, that as, as uh, Locke lays it out mm. uh, and so uh, this is kind of extrapolated in many ways yeah. to the nation state it's mm. a jungle out there there is no such thing necessarily as justice. It's just we behave yeah. because uh, uh, unless we're between equals, uh, we're not going to have justice. Uh, mm. So uh, we have to just behave the way we can to best serve our interests. Our own interests. Now, yes. now, okay, those are kind of the layers. So it's a lot of the jungle. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, we have no really other choice, but we have to work in our best interests. The other one is, no, we, 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 we have the opportunity now. The state is genuinely acting in their, interest, their best interests. Or the third layer, the first one I mentioned, is uh, it's actually the elites yeah. of the state who are going to benefit. That's why the state yes. has this foreign policy or that policy. So exactly. So to summarize that as succinctly as possible, basically, nations don't act in a truly humanitarian way. They don't. They don't invade yeah. out of out of selflessness or out of yes. purity of motive. It's always basically. Well, I think the way he phrased it. Correct me if you remember this differently. Was. National self-interest is a necessary and sufficient condition for nations to act. 
So they might also have some moral, you know, reasons for wanting to, you know, get involved in the world and help other nations out or invade other nations. But really, that, that's just kind of icing on the cake at that point. Yeah. Like the only real reason nations do anything, you know, India invading in Pakistan to put down a rebellion, Pakistan to put down a genocide or something like that. That's not really in the interest of stopping the genocide. It's because, you know, it discredits a, another nation, right? That, that, that's, it's ultimately nations are basically selfish. And that's the only reason that they ever act, is the, out of the virtue of selfishness. Right. Now, before so, so, we critique that, I just want yeah. to know that was what he was presenting. Yeah. You know? Now, would you just explain to our uh, listeners, what does that mean, nations uh, act out of, uh, with, uh, or, sorry, necessary and sufficient? Uh, for, do you want to right, that? yeah. So, uh, oh, this is a good... Uh, so, okay, there are certain things that are necessary conditions uh, for something to be present, right? right. So, okay. um Oh, what would be a good example? So in order for me to be a human, uh, I have to have a flesh and blood body. Okay. If I don't have that, then I'm not truly a human being. Uh -huh. Not fully human being. That's a necessary condition. But if you say, well, I have a body made of flesh and blood, therefore I'm a human. Well, that's not it, right? That's necessary. You need, that's got to be part of it, but you need something else there. Okay. Um, now, if you say that, uh, goodness, I'm a rational animal. Yes. Okay, well, that's a sufficient condition. That's all you need. Once you have animality you know yeah. my flesh and blood body and rationality that's the definition of human from an yeah. aristotelian perspective yes that's all you need you don't need anything else to explain it right so right so you got to distinguish between there's something that you need to have as part of a definition for something to be present but they're not complete necessary but not sufficient sufficient is once you have that all then you have what you need okay you know? so so uh, necessary would be featherless biped Yes, but it's yes, not, yes. But it's not sufficient. Yes, because there could be other featherless bipeds right, yes. that are not human. Exactly. Yes, Diogenes okay. could take a chicken and pluck the feathers right, off right, and say, right. "Well, that's a featherless biped, right. so it must be a human being." So that would be necessary, but not sufficient. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or all the ingredients of a cake. You could have, you know, your butter and your flour and everything, and everything else on that. But until you actually like bake, that, those are necessary conditions. You can't have the cake without them. But you need all those things plus several you know <laughs> several minutes at a certain temperature then you have a cake you, right. you know, that's sufficient for the cake because otherwise i just have mix some, some basically soupy. which might, might be tasty too but might. it's not cake right and he says that not not only is national self-interest necessary can I, can I ask you one more oh sure what about zoon politicon so this is aristotle's uh definition as well man is a political animal uh, I don't know. I know that owls have parliaments. Oh, okay. That's, that's the actual right. term for a collective noun of owls is parliament. So, no okay. totally, parley, so parley yeah, ensemble. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Parley ensemble. So okay. uh, that's why C.S. Lewis has uh, has an actual parliament of owls in um, Silver Chair. Okay. He's he's not just making that up. It's actually the oh. name for a collection of owls. There we is, go. Is okay. So he actually depicts it. them in a government. So okay, I will I will not commit to saying we're the only oh, okay. political animals. Right, but okay. we have Fair enough. again, it's a necessary <laughs> condition, but it's not sufficient. Okay. Uh, which actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. The fact that we're political animals is actually part of what I think is okay. wrong with realism. But so, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. Okay, what do we but let me talk a bit about what happened at the time. Oh, so right, Mr. Right. Hunt presents this and he gives all yes. these examples and he says realism can explain them all. And it's explanatory power is very robust. Well, that's the question. Because what he does, what he asked us then was, yes. can anyone think of a counterexample? Ah, can yes. anybody give me an example of a nation that acted uh, entirely selflessly? Like it, there was no, uh, it didn't benefit itself in any way, uh, but it just did it purely because of, you know, it was the moral and right thing to do. Yes. And it wasn't you or I, I don't think, but you, you had an answer. But someone else said, well, what about in the 80s? When Prime Minister Brian Mulroney yep. declared sanctions on, or uh, what's the word, Embar uh, what's the yeah, sanctions? Yeah, yeah like yeah, a tariff on, against yeah, on yeah. South Africa because of the, the apartheid, the apartheid yeah. regime, which yeah. neither Reagan nor Thatcher, which were the other, I guess you'd say right wing neoliberal you know leaders yes. at the time, Mulroney's always lumped in with them, but they continued to trade with uh, South Africa, uh, but Mulroney did not, and yeah. there was no economic advantage to that. There was no. You know, that didn't increase Canada's control over resources in Africa or right. something like that. So yeah. in what way would you explain that? My memory of what Mr. Hunt said was, well, yes, but it increased Canada's prestige in the world. Yes, right? yes. He had, yeah, so he had a rebuttal. So, yes. so yeah. It, so, it, a, so it really was in our self-interest. Because we are was, this middle power. Mm -hmm. uh, there, we have a limited uh, scope on the world uh platform mm -hmm. so th this was uh, still one upping uh, other nations yes. in, in taking this uh, moral stance mm -hmm. uh, or ostensibly moral stance that uh, yes mm -hmm. we so, are we're, we're, so exactly, we are yes. advancing so, our interests exactly right so, um, so now right away I, I, I will critique this later I'm talking about what we did in the moment because we didn't have the benefit of weeks to reflect yeah, on think about this in sure. the moment so you also gave an example which was uh, Meng Wanzhou 
I believe, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. So for context, uh, Canada arrested the CFO, I believe, mm -hmm. of uh, Huawei, which is uh, originally started by a military member uh, of, of the Communist Party. Uh, party of China, right? Yeah. Uh, and so um, it's it's well, a common phone network now, which which they only not sell just phones, but uh, infrastructure for phone networks. All right, there was some kerfuffle with loans uh, that were used to fund Iran or some trade going back and forth. And so the U.S. Uh, when uh, Donald Trump was president, uh, asked Canada to arrest mm -hmm. um, her when she landed in Vancouver. So Canada is in an awkward spot here in some ways, and but nonetheless, Canada did go ahead and arrest her. She was placed under house arrest, oh, I want to say it was two and a half years, something like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is how things played out. Uh, Canada, uh, China was livid uh, mm -hmm. over this. Uh, immediately, they executed uh, a Canadian uh, who was in jail for, for on drug charges mm. in China, he was executed, and then they arrested the two Michaels, mm. who spent uh, under uh, very austere uh, and um, confinement mm. uh, in, in China, in, in almost a solitary confinement, um, mm. in, in for in these conditions for. Um, Essentially, the length of Meng Wanzhou. Well, it was because yeah. they were all freed simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in, in fact. Um, in the newspaper, I was saying the Global Mail, uh, they would have at the bottom how many days they were in jail. Mm -hmm. There was a tracker going on. Uh, and so, yeah, they were keeping track of, of the Michaels who were in jail. So uh, the question was, why did Canada do that? Why, why, would, why would Canada possibly do that? Because how was that at all in our self-interest if um, we're going to aggravate uh, a major power like China? Well, mm. So he replied. He, there is a reply, and, of course. And so how did he, yeah. how do well, you recall him answering? Well, what I recall is simple. Uh, you're, this is going back to the um, law of the jungle uh, in, in the way things work. As this power, yeah, it might, you might not see an immediate benefit to your nation, but it's better than the alternative, which mm. would be upsetting an even greater power, your major trading partner, military um, uh, leader, and so on, uh, the, uh, our alliance uh, leader, the, the United States of America. Mm. Which, which Canada has done before without reprisal, but whatever, whatever. That's his, there that are his, some examples. Yeah, the with, war in during, Iraq. Even, well, even during the Cold War yeah. with... Mm. with um, uh, is it Diefenbaker, I want to say, but uh, well, it, he, well, yes, Diefenbaker didn't, but then he got you know kicked out, he, and then, he lost and then Pearson yeah. did what America, what Kennedy wanted. But anyways, yeah. yeah, there is precedent for us. So there's some precedent bucking uh, what America wants, sure. Yeah, but uh, but he did also say to you that he thought that was about as far as you could go. He did say that was Canada pushing up, you know, trying to be as moral as it could be and make the right decision as far as it could be. Yeah. But it was you know confined by, uh, like I said, the law of the jungle. You right. Know? Yeah. Although, ironically, or maybe not ironically, the uh, response that the Trudeau government gave to China was, because they were demanding her immediate release, mm -hmm. was, well, we can't do that mm -hmm. because uh, it, we follow the rule of law. Yes, yeah. Okay, so, so it's very interesting a response. We follow the For rule sure, of yeah. law. And so we can't just tell the judiciary what how they should behave uh there's certain processes which need to be followed mm. and uh, due diligence and so on and so looking at uh, extradition treaties and and and, and so mm. on and how this is all figured out so ostensibly that was yeah, the sure, answer sure, sure, sure. we yeah, can't yeah. Mm, we yes. can't interfere right yeah yeah this not is, right exactly okay. because of administrative things so this is when i spoke up I, or, right. uh, around this time around this time yeah i can't yeah. remember the exact chronology but i in response to him asking can you give an example Yes. Because it was starting to become clear that I, he wasn't going to accept any example right. as a counterexample. So yes. I put up my hand and said, well, what would you accept as a counterexample? Yeah. Because it sounds like if a nation does something that seems to be moral, but there's any advantage to it that accrues whatsoever, then you can say, oh, well, that you know, see, that proves it was only in their self-interest. Right. Right? It's it, like you're stacking the deck. It's an unfalsifiable theory. Exactly. Almost. So I said, would it have to, would it have, I asked him, would, would a country have to like suffer economically and lose own people and get no cred from the rest of the world and also still do something in order for you to accept it as an example of a yeah. reputation of realism? Because that's yeah. absurd. Like no country, yeah. even like, like just war theory says you shouldn't go into just war unless there's some plausibility in winning. Of winning. That's right. And his response, well, first, do you remember how he, 
how exasperated he looked when I asked him that. Yeah. He said, well, oh, I knew there was going to be somebody in the, the audience the, who was asking me that. There's a few things to say there. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. So one of his responses is very telling. He says, that is a philosophical question. Yes. And so he wanted to bracket it out. Mm-hmm. Put a bracket around it. That's a philosophical question, and I'm not dealing with philosophy. That That is a, another speaker would have to address that. Mm-hmm. That is not something I can address. And so let's come back to that. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. so let, let, we'll bracket put, that too. Put a, yeah. Uh, we'll, <laughs> yeah, so we'll put a pin in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, but mm-hmm. the analogy he gave was very telling. Yes. So mm-hmm. and this is an analogy. It's a helpful one. So he... Um, Shovel snow during, uh, I mean, of course. Uh, and, Periodically and, uh, it snows up here, yeah, if you haven't and, heard in Edmonton. And, and while he's out, it's uh, once you get bundled up and, and, and start going, well, maybe you're on a roll. So he has two neighbors, uh, you know, one to his right, one to his left, and he will shovel the walkway of uh, mm-hmm. one neighbor on the left, and he will also shovel the walkway of the other on the right. One of the neighbors and asked himself, why do I do that? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, one of the neighbors... Uh, I was in the fall. They uh, share apples with him, and so from their harvest, and he loves this. So, yes, yeah. so he feels perhaps this is his motivation mm-hmm. uh, that that it's in mm-hmm. one later in the year he will get some recompense, uh, reciprocal, uh, reciprocal uh, justice. I want to think of that way mm-hmm. from from his neighbor. The other one he wasn't sure about. Yes. So, mm-hmm. so he does it for them. But they don't really, they don't give them apples. They don't give them some, uh, they're not reciprocating. Uh, but perhaps there's something else. And, and so he's not yes. sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there must be something. There, there must, must be, be some something. self-interest yes. to it, but yes. he's not sure what it is. Yeah. And again, I, I mean, just hearing in the moment, later on I thought, oh, okay, there's... Well, there's, there's, that's uh, why I wanted to discuss it afterwards. I just, yeah. So let's, that's, I have, we have set the stage. Because, yes. because the rest of the talk was mostly... At that point, I kind of had what I needed from him, let's say. Sure, I was sure. clear where he was coming from. The rest of the talk was mostly him just giving more examples of, you know, ostensibly selfless interventionism yep. that was really self-interested well, well, from his perspective. Yep. We can talk about Russia at some point, because he said an interesting thing about Russia. But yep. having having now laid the groundwork, yep. we've had some for, time for to realism. reflect on yeah, it. Yeah, for yeah, what sure. realism, is, or at yeah. least what he's presenting as realism, yeah. right? Um, I wanted to just discuss this a little bit, because I think we could. it can be... The point of it is that he's not presenting this to a bunch of academics. He's presenting this to a bunch of social studies te- Well, to teachers, but it was social studies teachers. Sure. I don't think if you teach history that way, that's consistent with either a classical or a Catholic education. Right. And I wanted to discuss the problems with it and uh, maybe better ways of teaching uh, about world events and world history. Yeah. This way. For so, example, oh, so right, please, well, before well, I one, do. One thing, I, before getting into like the... the general critique which which i think we we put a pin in the the, the philosophical right, yes. thing we do have to come to that how about i know some of our students might be able to answer this question what about the one about shoveling snow so oh, so sure. how do you know if what you're doing is virtuous it or is it for some ulterior motive so i was just thinking of uh of we looked at with our seniors, with, with Kant, for instance. So how does he know? Or Kant gives a formula, actually. He gives an answer here. Mm-hmm. So he's like, I can't answer that. I don't know. Almost as if it was in a black box. It can't be mm-hmm. answered. Well, Kant, what would he say? Well, um, you might have a uh, business owner who, who uh, could take advantage of a uh, customer, a patron, and uh, why don't you? you know? mm-hmm. I mean, you'll get away with it. No one will catch you, and uh, you'll get more profits. And, and you'll get away with it. Well, he says, what you need to do is will the good. Yeah. Okay. So unless you will the good, what your action is not good. So you might not rip off your customer, but if it's so you can gain more profits, you haven't willed the good. Mm-hmm. So says Kant. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so for him, it's uh, the sign is you're willing the good. Sorry, the sign that you're mm-hmm. willing the good is that it causes pain, which is kind of like the counterexample you're thinking of. Like, how, how could I think of a counterexample? Mm-hmm. Does it cause inflict pain? Um, all right, that's one possible answer. I thought, well, students, not even seniors, those who are a little bit familiar with Aristotle, could have another answer mm-hmm. as to is what I'm doing just, or is this out of the goodness of my heart, or is there some ulterior motive going on? Mm-hmm. And so for Aristotle, what is the meaning of life? Well, it's eudaimonia, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and, and what is this? Well, it often translates as uh, happiness, but it's it, this flourishing of the human. Right, mm-hmm. we, we, our telos is being realized. Uh, our, our potential is being actualized. We're, we're, we're narrowing the gap between what we uh, could be and what we are. And so, through virtue, we strive for excellence moment to moment. So, 
in shoveling your neighbor's walk, well, yeah, you actually are engaging in virtue, flourishing. Sure, there could be some benefit because that was always a counterexample. Oh, there's some other benefit, yeah, like yeah, apples sure. and so on. Right, there right, could be yeah. some other. Yeah, of course, there's going to be other benefits. But what you're doing is you're striving mm-hmm. after uh, you're flourishing. You're flourishing. Mm-hmm. You're part of, and, and for Aristotle, of course, it's not forensic. You're going to flourish, and so is your polis, your community. One of my other example would be um, Augustine. Mm-hmm. Right? What do we strive after in life? Well, for him, he says, yeah, you, O Lord, have made us for yourself, but our hearts arise us until they rest in thee. So this is, this, uh, this, the whole bit is about finding peace. We can do this in a disordered fashion. That's concupiscence or the libido dominati. Libido dominati is desire to dominate, step on others, control them, right? And concupiscence, fill our appetites, mm. right? Uh, and pleasures. We're trying to seek peace through that. But we can also seek peace through ordered desire, mm. through loving things as they should be. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, perfect justice, and so uh, yeah, love of God, love of neighbor. So going back to the shoveling example, mm-hmm. <laughs> are you doing this uh, for to dominate others? Mm-hmm. Are you doing this out of some uh, pleasure motive? Uh, so so is it concupiscence? Is it libido dominati, or some intellectual? That's another possibility uh, thing you're satisfying, or is it out of this love, which is going to so? Though, I mean, I just mm-hmm. think of students, they might have those three thinkers to fall back on because mm-hmm. he said, I can't answer that. Yeah, I don't know. Well, you have Kant, yes, <laughs> you like yeah, Kant. yeah, he gives you the Sunday school uh, rational answer that's that's stripped sure. out of, of the Christian framework uh, mm-hmm. and, and so on. So mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. there's Aristotle, there's Augustine, there's lots of ways you can answer that question. All right, mm-hmm. so okay, that being said, let's go back now to the broader problem. Of mm-hmm. realism, mm-hmm. or at least that 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 that. Um, no, that all okay. relates though. I sure. Okay. Uh, do do yeah. you you want to run with that? Or do, well, I think well, I kind of there's a, there's a few branches that okay. I could that I could branch off sure, from. Sure. Um, well, well, for example, I mean the Augustine example is interesting because, yeah. uh, well, okay, let me let me let me say what I was going to say before. Sure, we'll sure, see yeah, if we, yeah. we'll see if we can get work okay, this sure. in because. He so here's where the classical Catholic educator should be ready to respond to this. Oh right, because which, he, which we weren't at the time. Which we were. Well, we're getting. <laughs> we were, we're getting ready. Yeah, we're. Well, we are. We are learning to be educators as well. Yeah, Lifelong yeah. learning. There you go. There you go. But he mentioned uh, Thucydides. He yes. said realism is not a. Well, so there's modern thinkers. I'll talk about one of them in a minute. The most popular one probably today, especially in the wake of the uh, Russia-Ukraine thing, is John uh, Mearsheimer, right? Yes, um, yeah, He comes from the tradition from uh, Hans Morgenthau. Uh, who I'll talk about in a second, uh, and you know you've got Machiavelli as well and Hobbes uh, and all this, yeah. but you know ultimately the, it goes back to Thucydides. He said in his history yes. of the Peloponnesian War, and Nietzsche, by the way, loved Thucydides. He said Thucydides uh, was the cure for Plato. Uh, he said he loved reading him because he purged him of Plato. Um, and there's a line that he quotes from Thucydides. Now this is interesting because it's like Shakespeare. People take quotes from Shakespeare characters and say, "Oh, Shakespeare said." It. Well, you got to look at who says it in it. Okay. He quotes the line from Thucydides: uh, "The strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must." Yes, which is related to what you were saying: law of the jungle. Sometimes weaker nations have to kind of go along. Yeah. Right. So, so there is justice between equals. Yes. But uh, what is it? The, the na- say that one again. The oh well, yeah. The, the strong do what they will, and yeah. the weak suffer what they must. The weak right. suffer what they must. Yes. Yeah, and just, what they do. Yeah. So justice can be had between equals. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, the strong do what they will, yes. mm-hmm. and the weak suffer. Now, the, the context of that, without getting into the whole history of the Peloponnesian War, yeah. you know, it's be- the conflict between uh, Athens and Sparta. That particular line yeah. comes from what's called the Milian Dialogue, or the Milian Debate. Right? Yeah. Athens is going to invade Milos, which, is, which wants to be neutral. Right. So they have a, a dialogue with them, but they, they intentionally yeah. exclude all the people. It's just yeah. like the diplomats, right? Yeah. Uh, and they have a very interesting discussion with them, where the Milians... Uh, are basically asking them, please don't invade us. And the yeah. Athenians are very politely like, but it's in our interest so to do. Yeah. Because if we yeah. don't invade you, we'll look weak. And yeah. then we've subjected a bunch of other people. And if we look weak to them, then they'll band together and, and try to throw off our yoke. And we don't really want that. So it'd be really, and, and, and it's in your interest to comply with us because otherwise we're going to destroy you. So, you know, you may as well just kind of uh, take it, you know. Um, and that's when they deliver that line. The strong yeah. do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. Yeah. And of course the Malayans uh, stand against them uh, and then are invaded and are you know pretty devastated. Right. So this is seen as, well, this is Thucydian realism in contrast yeah. to Herodotus, who will often talk about uh, the gods are involved with history and they punish people for hubris, right? Right, right. Um, whereas Thucydides is just a frank realist, supposedly. Yeah. Now, and because again, the Athenians don't want the the Milesians to to be involved uh, as they yeah, should be in right. Athens because that would mm-hmm. be the practice of the Milesians are not right? opposed. To, the Milesians are not going to take up arms against them. 
right. but they but they're still going to attack the Malians because they just want to assert their strength. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I mean, the Athenian practice though wouldn't it be to ha- allow all of them at the dis- at the at the speech, right? So it's this, uh, so they're not even following their own democratic. Uh, no, which, uh, which, procedures, which, right? which is exactly the city, supposedly yeah. realist. Right, right. Like, well, you know, yeah. They say that they follow this democratic principle, but they don't even appear to it themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, that sounds great. So this is where it would be great in a classical classroom to yes. sit down and actually read that dialogue. Because the Malians yeah. make an argument to them. And one of the arguments they make is, look, because it's not just kind of naive. Sometimes it's presented like they're just idealists and naive, and they hope the gods will come and save them. And yeah. Whereas, you know, the Athenians are hard-headed and rational. The Malians say to them at one point, well, look, there are certain rules of etiquette between nations, and if you go around breaking them all the time, then if the tides turn on you, it's not going to go so well for you. Right? Yeah. And the Athenians kind of blow that off. And, and the Athenians also say to them what I've said, like, well, we've got to assert our dominance everywhere because that's in our self-interest. Well, yeah. if you keep reading in Thucydides, the next thing they do right after Milos is they attack Sicily. Again, which is not really a threat. They don't need to, but right. they're using the exact same logic they use with Milos, and they get... It handed to them, you know. They get yeah. beat up, you know. They get uh, trounced in this battle, and that's the, the kind of the beginning of the end, <laughs> right, right, for the war. Yeah. Um, and then again, once once that happens, the Sicilians are not very kind to the Athenians because yeah. of exactly that. Because now the Athenians have reputations as bullies. Right. So if you look in the context of, yeah. and I'm not saying I'm not necessarily saying Thucydides said this, although he does say in Book Three of the Peloponnesian Wars, he indicates okay. that yeah, there's some rules. It's wise for nations to follow. If, if the Athenians are supposed to be the example of kind of hard-headed realism, they're not seen as a positive example. Like, by trying to follow right. the supposedly realist philosophy, yeah. that actually leads to their downfall. The Malians are a lot more right than the Athenians want to admit. And that's where I think a robust, maybe classical education could right. dump into that. And it gives context to how after the Peloponnesian War, a particular soldier in that war named Socrates starts uh, to speculate about, well, what yes. exactly is justice? And right. of course, you know, Thrasymus is like, Oh, it's the it's the power of the strong, basically. That's right at the beginning of the Republic, yes, right? Yes. And I think you could see that as being an extension of that Athenian policy that we saw in the Peloponnesian War. And Socrates just easily dismantles that and goes on and, and invents Western political philosophy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, or even before that, Polymarchus gives a definition. Uh, do good to your friends, mm. harm your enemies. Ah, sure. Polymarchus, uh, his name means warlord. Mm-hmm. And our Lord of War, right? And he was an arms dealer in the in the Peloponnesian War as well. All right, so, so, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's very much in, in the Republic, uh, in, in the background, what, what's going on. Mm. Yeah, so, so that's where, again, I think that poor Mr. Hunt maybe needed to be in a classical sure. context because this history does kind of uh, not, I'd say, ba- uh, boy up his realist uh, thinking. Um, but I also think there's a part of one of the things that in in the Republic they talk about is you know what is justice and yeah. there's a difference between most people would probably do the wrong thing and it is natural to do the wrong thing, right? There's a difference between saying most humans oh. sin much of the time and saying yeah. sin is part of human nature. Right, 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 right. Um, and that's so. This is the whole thing about the Ring of Gygus, right? Like, yeah, what would yeah. most people do if they had a ring that yeah. could turn them invisible? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Famously, also explored by Tolkien. Right? Yes. So yeah. the fact that most nations would perhaps act selfishly a lot of the time does not mean that that's a law of the nature of nations to always act selfishly all the time. Right. Uh, unless you're pre-committed to that, and if you're pre-committed yeah. to it, you'll always find some way in which it's actually self-interested. Uh, it's interesting because you mentioned Kant because yeah. the. Uh, the early realists, uh, well, like Kissinger, for example, his his dissertation was on how Hegel and Kant were totally wrong, about okay. because you know he, uh, Kant has this idea of kind of liberal peace and international yes, order, and so yeah, does Hegel, yeah. and well, Kissinger well, just rejects all yeah, of that. Yeah. You know, peace in our time or perpetual peace, right? Mm. So um, Woodrow Wilson was actually a Kantian uh, admirer, right? Yeah. And so his fourteen points and the whole idea of the League of Nations does follow in that. Um, how would you call it, tradition that stem coming from Kant. I mean, just to back up to Kant for a little bit, mm-hmm. what he has this understanding is, uh, like, at the forensic level, like the individual willing the good, mm-hmm. he also extrapolates this to a nation. So mm-hmm. at, a, at, a, at a, global's not the right word, national level, I suppose, mm-hmm. would be the term, um, we can also behave rationally. So following, like, the categorical imperative uh, mm-hmm. for a nation state, and so that will lead to perpetual peace, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then we'll have peace in our time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah. So, so, this is, so Kissinger and others might be reacting to this naivete 
of, of, of Wilson mm-hmm. who, you know, couldn't even pass this in sure, the yeah, yeah. Uh, to get the League of Nations off the ground. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you can look at, well, how things went with, with Ethiopia and, and mm-hmm. the Italian invasion uh, and all the rest and the appeals mm-hmm. to the League of Nations to do something about it. Well, right, right. Is, well, there a, is there a law that we're following? Is there an mm-hmm. actual principle mm-hmm. of justice that these nations have come together to adhere to? Or are we back to um, this mm. Athenian, uh, this Thucydides logic? Right, right, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. we just do what we can. We do what we will. Mm-hmm. We do what we will, yeah. And the weak endure what they must. And, and just another shout-out for our, our uh, grade 9 students reading uh, the Gorgias. Uh, this mm. is some of the, the exact same ideas mm. mm-hmm. uh, we see with, with um, well, especially Callicles, mm. uh, mm-hmm. espousing, right? So, yeah, so yeah. that's yeah, the week, the week, um, the week want rules. Well, right? yes, so, yes, so, yes. So, so mm-hmm. these weaker states mm-hmm. want rules. Yes, yeah. And the weak people follow rules because you know why? Mm-hmm. They're not daring. Sure. They're Which is very Nietzschean. Trying. Very Nietzschean. Well, well but yeah, this is Calicles, right? Mm-hmm. So Calicles yeah, yeah. is saying the same thing. So, I mean, obviously Nietzsche's uh, riffing on this a little bit. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but, yeah. So what do you think? Is, is justice for the weak? Uh, Ooh, school yeah. and Fawcett? Is, or is this, this, uh, this is a plea which the smaller nations are going to make because mm-hmm. they don't want that, though, you know, that big... Mm-hmm. Um, Juggernaut, uh, or, or the few major states out there to to call the shots. So we come up with this idea of of rules and mm-hmm. impose it on the strong. What do you think? So I uh, think that again, first of all, the Malian dialogue okay. I think discredits that because yeah. Athens tries to operate it. It tries to be above the law, do whatever it wants, yeah. and it ends up uh, falling as a result. Yeah, let's let's tweak this for the, for our listeners who have no idea what's going on. We're just trying to make. Okay. The most photogenic angle we can for both okay, of ourselves. Sorry. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, but let's let's go to more uh, recent history events. So you've got so okay. Well, let's in answer to your question, let's just do some genealogy work here, uh, right? Okay. Because then you have um, you know, Machiavelli yes. comes along, and uh, Machiavelli is obviously talking. Well, he's talking about states and about real. You know, again, it's a scientific yeah. poli- uh, approach to politics, right? Yes. Where, yeah. Um, and. That's a whole episode in itself because people debate about what Machiavelli was really saying, but I think you and I would agree that it's it's yeah. really a new religion of the self in a lot of ways. Um, yes, the triumph of the will. Um, yeah. But 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 let's let's for the sake of right now just succinctly say he says morality is irrelevant to the practice of politics. It's just entirely uh, about what a science of achieving certain results, effectual facts. Yeah, yeah, okay, that, yeah. Uh, okay, so we wouldn't quite say it's irrelevant, but um, or is it, or it's a new morality that he's inventing. It's, it's, but, yes, a new continent that he's exploring or d- discovering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so he has his book uh, fifteen, where he uh, of, of the prince, where he's going to use that word um, effectuality verita, but it, it's translated from the Italian as uh, effectual truth. Sometimes real mm-hmm. truth. Only time it's been used, and yeah, yeah. So that's where you get realism from. Yeah. Uh, this idea of what's what will get results. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, in terms of morality, he still wants morality. Mm-hmm. He wants morality for the people. Yes. To this, so again, this is going back to like the mm-hmm. almost the calculus saying the the morality is for the weak, yeah. the masses, mm-hmm. but the strong, mm-hmm. right? The the prince. Mm-hmm. There's just a few of us, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. We have the facade of being selfless. We have the facade of being honest. Mm-hmm. We have the facade of this. But when we need to, we can switch on and off mm-hmm. these virtues. So he redefines virtue to virtu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So virtu is this cold, calculating, callous, ambitious, and audacious mm-hmm. attempt to take control of fortune yeah. these are the the, the yeah, yeah, fortune yeah, yeah. fortuna is um, all the realm uh, events around us that we can't control mm-hmm. so yes he is he's, he's, he's still he, yeah. he will make mm-hmm. a case for morality for the masses yes, yes. and make a case for a new morality mm-hmm. a new virtu mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. the prince so the question then yeah well so what i think that is that's it's funny because someone like Mr. Hunt, I think, yeah. probably sees himself as like a critic of the empires, right? Uh, he's yeah. he's aware that they're selfish and you know, and, and yeah, criminal. Right. But I think you could make the case that realism is actually a, can be construed as a defense of it. Of just saying, well, yes, like sure, this empire or this nation is acting in a selfish, oh, right, self-interested right. way, but that's just how things work. Yes. You, can't, you know, you have to work this way. You know, we you know, we're compelled to, or it's the right, or it's the right thing to do. As much as he would says, oh no, that's a philosophy question, and I can't yes. answer it. Yes. But in fact, it is, and you know, Machiavelli is an example of this. So that, so there's that, and now to get into realism proper, which which kind of comes out of this real politic, which is then you know used by the Prussians, right? 
it's worth saying that there's at least a couple strands of realism that sure. are worth distinguishing. Yeah. One of them sees it as rooted in human nature. That right. human nature, and this is the Hobbes thing, humans yeah. by nature are competitive with each other uh, and that extends to a national level. You also got a what's called like a structural realism or institutional realism, which is what Mearsheimer says, which is yeah. it's not necessarily that nations are bound by the laws of nature to always fight with each other. However, given that there's no sovereign of the world, yeah, no Leviathan, right? There's exactly yeah, there's, there's no, no world, universal right, Leviathan. Exactly, there's no yeah. world government. There's no world Leviathan. Therefore, if there were, this wouldn't apply. Right. But given that we have a global anarchy, in lieu of that, nations happen to act this way. So he's not he's not making claims about human nature. He's talking about given the state of affairs in the world. You know, in the Middle Ages, maybe it was different when we had like a Holy Roman Empire and the Pope was you know when sure. Catholicism united. But given the the state of having separate nation states in the world today, yeah. realism emerges out of that. So it's worth saying that there's, there's two different kinds of um, realism at, at least. Yeah. And, and Mir Shabari, not, not to harbor that too much, he gives this three-part uh, address on he accounting for liberalism. He, took, it, 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 he said it took him several years to account for it. But anyway, well, I don't know Well, Mearsheimer, I mean, we could talk about him. Because, well, yeah. and this is for the record, and maybe we won't have time to talk much about this, but look into Mearsheimer because his, pro, his predictions are notoriously bad. Yeah. Uh, he he yeah. made lots of predictions back in the 90s. Well, yeah. well, we'll get to that because this is your question. Yeah. Your question is, yeah. do, is, is justice just for the weak? All right. So yeah. um, a, a hero to realists and maybe a hero to some Catholics, uh, Metternich, right? Okay. After Napoleon's empire falls, Metternich, yes. had, at the Con Congress of Vienna, he creates this, attempts to create this balance of power. Yeah. Right between the different empires. The Metternich, you know, he's a reactionary. Can we explain monarchist. to our listeners who is this? Who is this? Okay, so, okay, he's, so he's Napoleon. A, uh, right, so Napoleon. Uh, like Napoleon. Uh, well, you, I suppose you've heard of Napoleon. I hope yeah. everybody. Yeah. After his empire, which attempts to export Rousseau's philosophy all over the world, wherever it goes, yeah. it collapses for various reasons. Uh, Metternich was the foreign minister for Austria, who oh. actually had made a peace offer to Napoleon in 1813, and Napoleon turned it down uh, because Napoleon said. Um, <sighs> If you see, he said, "You're hereditary monarchs. They don't know what it's like to earn a country. I've earned uh, a country by my own military yeah. strength, yeah. and I'm a soldier, and I'm proud of it. And it would dishonor me to give them up." Which, uh, right away, I actually think that's almost a rebuttal of realism. Because had Napoleon been prudent, he would have been like, "Yeah, sure, I'll concede a few territories that nobody needs, and therefore maintain my power over France and the rest of my empire." Yeah. Uh, but no, for him, it was about honor, right? Which I suggest shows there's more going on than just national self but, 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 wouldn't, but wouldn't that be um, going back to the human nature realism? Mm -hmm. uh, I, like, like it's in Napoleon's nature, he's too proud to to give up what he's he's got. Well, there's I a mean, question of whether that's brute self interest, or because that right. seems like it's a it's a virtue, almost uh, a virtue. Anyways, that that okay, could be okay, a whole sure, whether sure, that sure, counts sure, or okay, not. Okay, okay. Uh, he his empire fall, you know, after some ill ill advised uh, you know things he's done. Um, and then Metternich, who's still in Austria, and he's yep. very conservative, reactionary, monarchist, yep. uh, Catholic, although he has some kids out of wedlock, I think. Yeah. Uh, he's, at one point, there's talk of making him a lay cardinal, actually. But anyways, <laughs> okay. Metternich chairs the Congress of Vienna, yeah. which is an attempt to do kind of say, okay, let's, let's redraw these boundaries to make sure all these... And he kind of wants to keep Russia in check, too. It is 1840s. This is 1814 to 1815. Oh, 1814. 1815, 16, I think, yeah. Oh, this is right 18... after the Battle of Waterloo, then? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because, well, because Napoleon gets back into power. He, he, he abdicates because he's doing badly, but then he decides he's going to be in power again. Yeah. And then he has Waterloo, and then that okay. fails. So this obviously. is the so, immediate aftermath. This okay. is right after Napoleon's okay. gone. Uh, so this is like the this is the Treaty of Versailles of its time, okay. in, a, in a sense, right? Like, and it's almost exactly the Treaty of Versailles. Okay. So, so tie this in then to the strong making up, or oh, um, are the are the weak making up? Well, so the rules, he so what? he's seen as a hero to a lot of realists because okay. his policy is well. First of all, he wants to suppress revolutionary ideas, but he wants to keep like Russia and you know and Austria, Austria and uh, and even Great Britain in some ways. He wants them to all be powerful enough, but not too powerful. He wants to balance. But, so he assigns, you know, I think Poland is given to Russia. Like yeah. it's just all drawn up just with a goal of balance of power. And this will prevent war from happening. Yeah. And arguably it worked for like 50 years until okay. at least 1848, maybe until, depending on how you view it, because you know, sure. uh, up till World War One, okay. arguably. He, it's seen as successful to some extent, right? Um, but it's not really successful, though. Because 1848, there's a whole bunch of revolutions across Europe, right? right? Uh, and those are all um, revolutionary ideals, right? It's all like people who right. have, are infected with Enlightenment ideas yes, and yes. don't want to put up with this anymore. And so they're willing to take the, you know, to go ahead and have revolutions. And yeah. 
and then of course ultimately that, that, that attempt to stop war through oppression doesn't work after a while. It breaks apart. The powerful and what happens to these powerful nations, right? Like, you know, Austria Hungary is not, you know, a dominant empire anymore. Great Britain's not it's a commonwealth now, right? So all these nations all these empires of the, I mean Russia Russia's its own thing, but it's certainly yeah. not what it was, you know, in eighteen fifteen. Right. Um, that all falls apart with uh, World War One, right? Yeah. For, definitively. Certainly eighteen forty eight pushes it, but you know, World War One definitively shows this has failed, right? Yeah. After World War One, Pope Benedict the fifteenth well during World War One, Pope Benedict the fifteenth has a bunch of peace proposals. Yes. Right. And he's seen as being very sympathetic to the Germans because okay. he says uh, we should forgive them. Yeah. So he's actually dubbed the Kraut Pope. Oh, oh wow. he's so, you're so sympathetic to the German. Yeah. It's interesting that the next German pope calls himself Benedict. Benedict anyway. okay, sure. But um, Wilson has his peace plan, yeah. which is largely similar to the Pope's, maybe stolen from the Pope, some okay. would say, okay. but it doesn't include the forgiveness of Germany. Oh, right. So after Germany is defeated and humiliated, obviously they impose these crippling sanctions on yeah. Germany, which John Maynard Keynes kind of warns about in yeah. the economic sanctions of the war. And of course, this creates so much resentment in Germany that we know what happens. Yeah. Right? It leads to Hitler. It leads to World War II, which again is devastating to these empires. Yeah. Right? After World War II, rather than continue to be punitive, Germany and France form an economic union. Mm -hmm. And it's called it's the Schumann Plan. Right. right. And Robert Schumann is a devout Catholic, like yeah. an extremely ascetic Catholic. He not only has he studied Jacques Maritain, but he like he has a lot of there's a call there's calls for him to be a saint, okay. actually. Well. And so you can't separate that from this policy of forgiveness, okay. like, which is which harkens back to what Pope Benedict called for. And that's the beginning. So then there's the they sign the deal about uh, coal and steel. Right. right, right. And that develops okay. into the, the European the, Union. Right. And right. this is important because. Realists are very skeptical of international institutions because that goes against the idea that nations always act in a self-interested way. Right. right. Now, there are some realists who kind of hedge their bets and they're like, well, maybe there's ways for institutions to work. But like a Mirsch, that's why Mearsheimer predicted after the fall of the, uh, the Berlin Wall, at the fall of the Soviet Union, oh, Europe is just going to like start tearing itself apart. Right. And, he, and he suggested putting nukes in Germany, actually. To, oh, okay. try, to try to to try to again have the balance of power, but yeah. that and, and a lot of them are really skeptical about the EU. And I'm I'm not here to say whether the EU is good or not. I'm here to talk about whether it works. And so far, it has. Right? Yeah. Like nations, you know, have economic interdependence and they share a kind of cultural um, heritage with each other sure. that seems to yeah. hold them together. Uh, Pope yeah. Benedict wrote about this. Right? He had a couple yeah. books on Europe. Uh, so, in response to the question, your question, yeah. are laws just for the weak? Yeah. It seems like, no, the, by violating these kind of moral laws, it actually hurts large, powerful nations. It's more in their interest okay. to follow morality, right? Okay. To be generous, to be forgiving, to be yeah. Christian even in yeah. some ways, yeah. right? Then, then it is to be op oppressive, right? And, self, right. Uh, and so forth. And, and this goes back to the political animal thing. If yeah. man is naturally a political animal, so unlike what Machiavelli says, unlike what Hobbes says, even unlike kind of what like Locke says, because even Locke would say, well, we have to kind of, create government, right? Like we have to ascend to it consciously and this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, or, you know, or Rousseau's, yeah. yeah, social contract. You know, Aristotle, Aquinas, you know, Augustine's in this tradition, say, no, we're naturally communal. We're made in the image of God, right? right? We're naturally Trinitarian. Um, now, we're, we're sinful, so yes. that interferes with it. But no, a nat one of our natural goods, you know, our natural goods are, you know, Aquinas has like three. I think he gets this maybe from Aristotle, you know, self-preservation as an individual, you know, reproduction, like our family and community life, like friendship, right? That's natural to us. Right. That's why nations form in the first place. And right. it seems to be why the international communities form. Yes. And they seem to, in some ways, they can seem to work without having to be oppressive, yes. right? Yeah. Potentially. I and mean, then certainly that's, you know, what the popes since Vatican II have, have called for. So no, I don't think, uh, I don't think laws are just for the weak. No, I okay. think laws are for the strong yeah. as well. And uh, Socrates would agree with you. Mm. So <laughs> this this is this is argument uh, with with Calicles, right? So so mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's 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 in your own interest to be good, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to getting away with you can. He gives this amazing mm -hmm. image where he gets. Uh, uh, Calicles to imagine with him there in a market square and he's mm -hmm. going to dagger up his sleeve and sure, he can yeah. eliminate anyone he wants. Or imagine if you have the ability to impose, uh, take away anyone's property or throw them in, bind them, put them in jail. Would you do it? Mm -hmm. And Sarge's like, no. And then and his, his uh, opponents are like, are you kidding me? You're lying. Yeah, There's yeah, no yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. There's no way you wouldn't do that if you had the power. Well, 
Are you saying it would, it would go against justice? Now, okay, let's let's bring this maybe to a close. Sure. I, I, there's too much. There's too many more things that we want. No, to that's true. But, I, have, I have a final thoughts, but okay. I'll, I'll let you share uh, what you have. But, but right. going back to the question, we remember put a pin in the the comment. Oh no, you can't ask that question mm -hmm. because that's philosophy. Yes. And I'm dealing with realism, so I hope mm -hmm. our listeners, uh, just from what we've been discussing, might be able to come away with an impression that wait a second, realism is also a philosophy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So, so yes, to, say, yes, to say that, oh no, that's philosophy, is to miss the point. Yeah. It's, it's similar to the person who says, I will only believe uh, something uh, is true if science proves it's true. Yeah. Mm. Now, they're not realizing that is not a scientific statement. Uh, that is yeah. uh, known as empiricism or scientism. It's where I only believe something can be empirically verified or measured by science. That's all I'm gonna believe is true. It's only, the only data I'm going to admit as verifiable are making worth making uh, true statements about. That is a philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's not science. So that's a philosophy which you come to the table with, and many students, many people don't realize it's not science that says that. That's a philosophical stance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when he says, "Oh, I can't answer that question," uh, of uh, it's because that's philosophy, and I'm here to talk about politics, mm -hmm. right? I'm here to talk about realism, which it's, is a very science teacher way of thinking. It, it right. Is, mm -hmm. right, because again, following Machiavelli, uh, in the mm -hmm. wake of Machiavelli yeah. rather, mm -hmm. and, and, and Bacon and, and others, um, yes, it's reducing our, our spectrum of reality to what is effectual, mm -hmm. what is practical, right? Uh, and so as, as men of practical affairs, mm -hmm. right? And, and how we get results. Well, that's all the bandwidth we can consider. So we're not considering philosophy. We're only considering the results that can happen in this realism. because. Again, going back to the science thing, uh, coming from a science teacher background, the idea here is there's predictability mm -hmm. in how humans are going to behave, or if you get enough of them together, how a state's going to behave, and they're going to follow these laws. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it is, right? And so that's mm -hmm. that's realism summed up in some ways. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we don't have even time for this, but uh, what if it's true? <laughs> okay, so, mm -hmm. so uh, not in the sense of philosophically, but what if practically... Mm -hmm. What if most states do behave like this? Mm -hmm. My question, and to think about this for maybe another time, mm -hmm. can a faithful servant of Christ get into politics? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right? So, so I, I guess that's some really good answers there. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe we'll save that for another time. I, we will, but I do, that is, I do because this is so realism specific, I do want to just mention this. Okay, though. sure, um, sure. Because, so uh, uh, he was trying to remember, I think he was, Mr. Hunt was trying to remember a guy's name. At one point, he couldn't. And I believe he was thinking of Hans Morgenthau, who okay. was kind of, who's kind of like he was like a mid twentieth century uh, yeah. realist writer who's considered kind of the father of modern realism in some ways. Morgenthau, I'm not going to get into him in detail, but I will say one of the people who influenced him was Reinhold Niebuhr, okay, and right, right. who, of course, Christian theologian, but who called himself a Christian realist. He was basically like a pacifist, yes. but he came to think and he's and a Protestant. This is important. He's a Protestant theologian. And, he, and, of course, there's that kind of Lutheran, Calvinist tradition of saying, like, sin is almost, it is part of our nature. We have a sinful human nature since yes. the fall. So sin is inextricably tied up with the world. So Niebuhr comes to kind of accept this and say, okay, well, if that's the case, we basically can't help but sin. Therefore, in the interest of some justice, we have to do sinful things sometimes. So he has the book Moral Man and Immoral Society. Okay, right? That yeah, title yeah. sums it up for you, yeah, right? Yeah. So. Morgan thought was influenced by this, right? It's, it's that, okay, you, you can be personally as moral as you want to be, but like, unfortunately in this, let's say fallen world, um, sin is unavoidable, all right? Uh, okay. and, and international politics, is un there's an original sin in politics and you just kind of can't so get over it. Right? immoral world. So a moral man in an immoral, immoral world. So you, in a sense, yeah. you, you have to do politics, right? Yeah. You have to, because I mean, Niebuhr's like a big anti-communist in this kind of thing, okay. right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, that does mean you're kind of committing yourself. You, you can't help but sin while doing it, and unfortunately, that you just have to, and that's fine. Okay. And that's a theological, which is why there's people who respond to Niebuhr who kind of say, well, Niebuhr's right, but no, you can't sin because you're a Christian, yeah. which yes. means Christians can't be involved with politics, and that's like the John Howard Yoder, Stanley Howard Wass kind of tradition of Christian yeah. pacifism, right? Where Christians yes. kind of can't be part of politics. Yeah. Uh, now, I think another episode we'll have to talk about this. Can a Christian be involved with politics? Yeah. I will just say well, okay. the Catholic tradition is that yes, you can be, right? Yes. Because you never have to sin. Right. right. Yes. Um, and that used to be a genre. I, I mean, uh, the mirror for princes. It was a genre right. of literature yeah. that you would give to uh, a prince, a Christian prince, to say, here's how to be an ethical, moral ruler. 
Right. Uh, Augustine, you know, yes. in a sense, city of God is that. But, I've heard it argued that in a way, uh, like First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings might be a kind of mirror for princes for the okay. Hebrews. In, um, in, what, in what sense? Th they're showing you what a good king would do and what a bad king oh, would do. Oh, what not to do? It's okay. like yeah. Josiah is being performed as like a model, for example. Oh, I right? see. You know, oh, I, oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, we, okay, yeah, yeah. All right, right. Exactly. Okay. And then yeah, Mac, because sure. Machiavelli is writing his own mirror for princes, right? In the prince, he's yes. just yeah. he's inventing a new version of it where it's like, well. well Here's what you should be doing. Yeah, and virtue, yeah, right? Yeah, not it, virtue, not virtue, but virtue, right? Yeah. And so I would, and Thomas Aquinas writes one as well on kingship. Um, so the the Catholic tradition is yeah. yes, you you can be a Christian ruler without sinning. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, clearly, like in City of God, Augustine mm -hmm. says, like it, this can be an exercise of temperance. Mm -hmm. you, you you could punish your enemies mm -hmm. while in your power, but the virtue here is not to. Mm -hmm. He says also to be slow to punish, mm -hmm. quick in mercy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also not to allow lawlessness to reign. Mm -hmm. Think of a, yes, a, a yes. teacher who doesn't impose rules on their students. Sure, it's sure. lawless in there. Mm -hmm. so yes. that's not virtuous. You, you, need, you need to have virtue there as well. Yeah, and, exactly. And, yeah. and so uh, this, this is, uh, yeah, he says there is room for, for uh, so basically, if you want to take one thing away from City of God, what Augustine says here is, you don't need to go to the altar of demons mm -hmm. to exercise political power. Ah, yes. Yeah. There is uh, another way. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is another way. And so my, is it. there you have it. So my final thought would be: not only is realism politic, uh, polit philosophical, it's also theological. Yes. It's also it's also committed to a theological proposition, oh. which is that you have that it's a Protestant view of sin, that nature and, and the world is tied up with sin, and you can't help but sin. And if, if you accept that, that's one thing. But if you're a classical Catholic school yeah. and a classical Catholic educator, yeah. uh, you, have, you have to say that's not only philosophically wrong, it's theologically wrong. It is possible to be involved with this world and not sin. And that's, in fact, that's what the medieval uh, political order was based on. This yeah. idea that the incarnation meant that you could be in this world and still be holy. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you don't have to... I mean, you could join a religious order, but you don't have to, mm -hmm. right? There's other ways of being holy mm -hmm. in this world. Including taking up arms in some cases. You can be a crusader and uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux can still write a rule for you. That's right. for that's for another day. Is there sure. anything you wanted well, to include I'm just thinking of well, St. Thomas More, right? So St. Thomas More would be a classic right, yes. example. Right, so, and that's um, an interesting point. You don't have to just, that doesn't mean you'll be successful in worldly terms. Right. <laughs> you might end up with your head cut off. Sure. But you can still be a Christian politician. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it depends what you, what kind of success you're aiming at. Exactly. Thomas More and Machiavelli might disagree, but that's so. That was our takeaway from this uh, yep. session. Maybe not what Mr. Hunt wanted us to, but uh, I think but still something very useful. Very I, fruitful. I think so. I hope. I hope so. Uh, anything you wanted to add? No, I, th I think that's great. Yeah, I think we're out of time now. So we are a little thank, over thank time. You, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you for listening. Would you like to close in prayer? Yeah. Morning? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Saint Isidore, pray, pray for, for us. us. Well, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Take care.